Hey. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Ah, Stuart, so good to have you here. And it's to good there. to have you here, John. <laughs> and, uh, you know, thanks to the wonder of um, computer technology science. There you are in Hawaii, and here I am in lockdown London City. You, you. <laughs> London. <laughs> We're in semi lockdown in Kauai, but it doesn't feel that way. Um, and it's funny because I talk to a lot of people and they talk about, again, we're in this lockdown type of period, but a lot of people are really feeling a sense of freedom and of liberty happening during this time of integration. It's so fascinating to me. There's a vibrational shift, isn't there? It's really, really big. And I, I don't know what your sense is, but I really could feel it deep within my body after the, the new moon, sorry, after the full moon. Um, well, it's now five days ago, six days ago something huge took place. And it seemed that there was an alleviation of the pressure that had been there, as we know, in different constituent parts, right from the very beginning, which of course taken us into terrible fear and the wildfire of fear of, you know, for example, our conversation this evening, uh, will I, how will I survive and thrive in COVID? Were we going to survive? Well, look what's happened. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that. It's like, how many times do we have to fear not survival to realize that we keep surviving over and over again? And that's a whole different conversation. But I think it's key and it's part of what's at the root of these instinctual, primal aspects of ourselves that we're learning to have a different relationship and really formatting to live in this new age because we're no longer the creatures from you know, 15,000 years ago. Yes, yes. So. I hear you. But I, if I may, I also feel that it's very much part of our conversation and we've sort of touched on it a bit. I mean, I feel that actually what we've been through is the great death. Mm. And that the death is actually, the dying rather, is a transition and a resurrection into a new way of being or a new level of being. But the death is actually to do with the fact that we are no longer going back. We are no longer going to allow the, the compromise, the efficiency or lack of efficiency, certainly the coercion of what the old system was all about, which we mindlessly gave ourselves to through doing, 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 doing. And of course, most of the time, if we're really honest, we're not doing what we could be doing because we're just trying to live the system rather than how does this inform me? You know, it's what we were saying just now about, am I really living or am I just existing? Well, yeah, and I've gotten into frustration and anger and blowing up on the inside about that. Sir, I want to hold this thread and go deeper into this conversation because this is really at the core, at the gist of this surviving and thriving. Um, and what's coming up for me personally also that I've witnessed, um, and you speak about it so eloquently, so to share those perspectives and to go deeper into it is wonderful. So y'all, we're going to talk about that and go so much deeper. And again, this is a three-part series that Stuart actually invited me to, to co-create with them. So when Stuart reached out to me and suggested that we do something together for our communities, it was an immediate yes without having to know the why, just the impetus of the yes and the collaboration and then the whys came afterwards. So Stuart, I'm gonna be very transparent about my why right now. And then I wanna take us into an energy that Stuart led me into a couple of days ago as we, were re as we were organizing what was going to be shared here. And again, this gets to my essence of the why also, Stuart. So indulge me for just a second. Um, first of all, my why was, I was excited to collaborate with someone that I felt I can learn and grow from, but also have deep conversation with. So that depth of intimacy that just sparks um, that passion and purpose in my life. So that collaboration immediately was a yes, and I felt it throughout. So it was a vibrational match for the impetus of what's possible, those possibilities that were ignited within ourselves and that we recognized, but the harmonization for it just wasn't, it just hasn't been there, it has been, but in different ways. Um, and I'm gonna turn off my notifications here in a second, I apologize. Um, so that was my first yes. And then how can I bring something forward and share what's coming through me um, for a community that, um, that is very much involved and, and wants to, again, have this intimacy that I'm connecting with here in Stewart. And again, we get to share that and ripple it out to all of y'all. And the other transparency is that I want to engage you guys more. I want you 
all to be more part of my community. Stuart and I are both going to ask you to go deeper if it resonates for you into different type of offerings. I have a membership that I'd love for y'all to join. Some of y'all are already there. We'll get more into that afterwards. Stuart has his readings, other courses coming up, his book, that's amazing. And we'll talk about that very lightly, but I wanna be very transparent with my intention of what to do with this so that we just get that out of the way because a lot of times people put together webinars and they do this and it's free and free isn't necessarily so free. And so I want to relax our minds and our hearts. And this is an invitation as friendships, as collaborators in this expansion because we're all doing this together. And notice I said doing this, not going through this together. We're all doing this together. And so in that impetus, Again, in transparency, that is what resonated for me in the intention of putting this together. And there's some core intentions that you have certain, and I want to get into, again, what you asked me last week that ignited like this. I welled up in tears. Um, sir, what was your intention behind this? What is it that's propelling you um, to bring this forward with me in this community? I yearn for two things. Mm. I yearn for the search of kindness in people's eyes. And I've spent a number of years wandering around this planet and I often don't find that. So I yearn for it. And therefore my life, I speak openly, is dedicated to the arousal of kindness and therefore the arousal of love, compassion and empathy in whatever the interaction is. Number one, I see kindness in your eyes. And Part that what that does is to draw me to the second why, which is that I feel that whenever you and I connect from the moment that we met four or five years ago to all of the conversations that we've had either off camera or on camera, that something crucial happens between the two of us where I know that I am indented, I am impressed, the whole of my soma, Right now, I can feel angel bumps going all the way over my body, that something happens in your presence. So I feel, therefore, you know, not wishing to sound grandiose, but I feel that that cruciality leads us to a combustible energy between us. And as a result of who we are as men, the choices that we've made about our own innate integrity and how we wish to communicate this in the world. So we're very transparent with our shadow. We're very transparent with our fearlessness. Mm -hmm. That meeting you allows me to share that level of combustibility, which creates an amazing piece of copper wire between heaven and earth where the angels move through us. And, you know, we were experiencing today, I feel that those significant spirit guardians that work with us that we know of, such as in my case, the revelation over the last three years of the, the secret that I lived of working as Diana Princess of Wales, voice coach and confidant, that that needed to come forth so that her message could stimulate the women of the world and the men of the world, but I say the women of the world and then the men of the world, because if the women can lead us forward because of their innate sensibility towards the truth of love and the truth of compassion and the truth of empathy and just getting down to it all, you know, in the sense of the way that women are just so extraordinary about their honesty, about their bodies and about helping the children being with the children and children can be dirty. So let's get down there and clean them up, you know? Um, mm. And then the men will follow. And of course, what's extraordinary, if I may just quickly extrapolate on that, is at the moment, you know, I was doing a survey only the other day to see the remarkable women that are stepping forward and are already invested with the sovereignty of new leadership. And of course, I'm talking about Jacinta Ardern in New, in New Zealand and a number of very remarkable women who are being given positions of premiership throughout Central Europe, who are becoming prime ministers and presidents of countries. And they are so cool. Yeah, they're really leading something forward. Again, so amazing. And, and thank you for that amazing compliment, by the way. Um, and I feel that connection also. And, it's, and 
And I, you know, and I just wanted us to be able to be combustible together, like a, an extraordinary cauldron or crucible of neo-paradigm identity, because both of us somatize, we embody it, not in some, oh, it's an idea, let's somatize, but we really just go there. And so for me, whenever I talk with you, it's a deep dialogue, and it's immensely significant, because if I see conversations all over the world, and I would like to say that all of my work is about having a conversation, whether it's with a dear one who comes and is in, you know, jeopardy, rather like the person that was with me before we met this evening, um, you know, whose husband has just died of COVID and she doesn't know what to do and she's got five children. Um, so I was helping her be able to look into the nature of why he's chosen to pass, et cetera, et cetera. Whether it's for me standing in front of a thousand people and talking, it's all about having a conversation. Now, our conversations are deep dialogues. Yeah, they are. It, well, that's funny. I actually, I pulled, I, I don't want to get too far off topic, but it's funny. I pulled a, a tarot card about what's our conversation going to be about. And I got the, the Queen of Cups and the Queen of Cups is about deep conversations. The Queen of Cups does not know how to do superficial, nor will she. She invites you and she's warm and she's inviting. And she shares her knowledge and her passion with everybody she touches because she emanates from that love. And so she will not hold back what she sees is available. And, and I truly think that I want to carry this forward in the intention of this three-part webinar. Stuart and I are not holding back our love. And we're going to invite you into, into the profundity of it so that you can feel it, so that you can see that reflection in yourself as well so that it ignites a spark of remembrance in you, whether it's a little one or a big one, and that you get to carry that forward for the benefit of others who you get to love with your grace, with your wisdom, with your presence of being. So it's wonderful. Stuart, I would love it if you take us in. So Stuart the other day asked me this very poignant question. Um, do you remember the question? Yes, I remember the, I remember the essence of the question. I will probably paraphrase it, but we, we were exchanging. So what, what is, does this really mean? Why is this necessary to have this conversation? Why do we wish to invest in a deep dialogue or the curing conversation that we were talking about? And I, I remember there was a moment of silence between us and I said, John, what is it your heart? What do you see at the very core of what your heart is about and what your soul is all about in relation to this conversation? And this is what Stuart does so beautifully. It's so graceful. But immediately, he, he asked me to drop in into that intimacy, to take a pause and to reflect. And you'll listen to this, what this time is about, to take a pause and to reflect. And what's truly in authenticity emanating from this, what is it that we're carrying now, presently? Not what we're going to carry tomorrow or after this webinar is over or a year from now, but what's true right now. And being in that state of presence, I just took a deep breath and closed my eyes barely for a second. Immediately, this golden light was streaming through me. Um, it was, for me, it was like a Christed consciousness type of light that was ignited. And it wasn't just a vision, but what it evoked in me from a sensory, I, I welled up in tears. I was at one with that energy, with that eminence of love. And it was so beautiful to just be called forward in it and to, by pausing, to recognize it and be in relationship with it. And again, it's, it happened in a relational aspect. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to invite that in for all of y'all, for all of us, Stuart. And if you would perhaps lead us into today's call, or if you can provide a, a spark for everybody that's with us today to drop into that with us as well. Sure. And maybe, you know, this, this aspect of our exchange is the impetus that can lead everybody who is with us now and those who listen to the recording of what is at the very core of your heart in relation to this deep dive, this deep dialogue of will we survive and thence will we thrive. And so what we, you know, if we just take, a, all of us take a moment just to feel, okay, so how aware of my body am I? Because I know that my body is a temple for my soul and that what we are, 
are spiritual beings having a human experience. So we've chosen to be in flesh to re zaret or remember what we experience purely in source. And so the pranic cord can be aligned, meaning if we just imagine that the whole of our spines are full of a golden beam of light and right at the very center of it in our hearts is a beautiful golden star that has in the center of it a small aperture that we know is our trajectory directly into the source. And as a result, we can feel, I mean, I feel completely activated because it's not a new idea to me. I feel you are because I can see you are. That what we're feeling is the fact that that aperture is now embracing, actually, literally, as it were, oozing the love light circuitry of the galactic heart, the Christos, the unconditional love of no separation, pure unity consciousness, all is oneness within love. Now that energy between us, I feel, is branching out into millions and millions of ripples and touching everybody that we are with within the morphogenetic field, the field of consciousness that we are, and it's going beyond and beyond and beyond. So maybe in this moment we can take full responsibility for being the social beings that we are and allow the ripples of light to go off into the people who we care about in our immediate um, social parameter, whether it be our family or our friends, who perhaps are not easily conversant with these qualities of linguistic, to do with soul, to do with spirit, and then into the extraordinary people who are right at the forefront of the leading edge of healership in relation to COVID-19 and all the other extrapolations of COVID, so that their hearts are emblazoned with this one unity mm -hmm. consciousness. Ah, oh, beautiful story. I feel that. And so, so it is. Amen. Okay. And beautiful. And I actually want to add just a little bit to that as well. And so, as we have those ripple effects, let's also invoke and invite in our ancestors, those who came before us through their trials and tribulations and their successes. We are the accumulation of who they are. We are who they dreamed about that was gonna be in this time, that was going to lead something moving forward in consciousness and spirituality of what being human was to mean. We, we are what they thought was possible. So let's invite them into this conversation, their essence for gratitude and honor and reverence for who they were in their journey. And let's invite in the angelics and the cosmic beings that are with us as well. Let's open our hearts to all those who want to be in this energy, in this intimacy with us. Let us not close the door to the truth to be received and opened in everybody's heart. And it's the truth that lies underneath the subconscious that would want to try to control because it doesn't know. But it lies at the essence of the soul, which cannot be fragmented, which cannot be diluted. It is the light that sacred flame within us that we are calling all those close to us and that we are connecting with through that their divine flame and igniting something that this world has never seen before so sir thank you that's amazing oh my goodness me thank you john mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a discipline that i always use when i go into something that's very demanding, such as talking to a very large group of people. And that it's certainly an, an element within my um, training as a presentations coach, you know, that people always feel so alone. And of course, the public speaking phenomenon, as we know, is the number one fear. I mean, more people are more terrified of public speaking than they are of dying. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, although we're coming to terms with that, it seems to be a major feature in our lives where we're fearful. So I always say, no, you're not never alone. Bring 50,000 of your ancestors through. Mm -hmm. And as you've just said, all of our angelic guardians and spirit, um, spirit custodians, all those, well, Martin Luther King called them the cosmic guardians, mm -hmm. the angels of our better nature. Um, beautiful, beautiful. So 
this is great. And, you know, and maybe in this moment I can say through you, because you've helped me evoke this, um, thank you for all the people that are listening in, because they're now also part of this communion. We're redefining the nature of our social gatherings, aren't we? That we've lived too long in separation. And now what we need to do is to come forward into collaboration so that the eth ethos of competition is a complete thing of the past, that we're not competing, we're co-creating. Right. Beautiful. All right, y'all, we're diving in. Not that we haven't already, but just what's been about this, it's a really setting a beautiful foundation for the rest of what we're putting together. So surviving and thriving, Stuart. Yes. Surviving and thriving. Where would you like to start? <laughs> well, will we survive? And the interesting thing is that we are surviving. And anyway, the existential question of will I survive is pointless in the face of death. Because we know that death, the myriad references that we have, I was just listening into the most amazing doctor this afternoon who has come through some work that I'm doing here in this city. Because of course, you know, when I got back from Egypt in March, having evacuated my group, my retreat group, I had to, once I'd recovered, I had to dive into helping two extraordinary doctors that have been clients of mine for over 20 years. And it just so happens that they're consultant virologists. So I've been going in. Anyway, so they introduced me to this amazing doctor who is there and has been dealing with um, palliative care and hospice care after interning and consulting within ICU, was talking about death as, of course, there is no ending. It is not a point of completion. It is purely and simply a modus to transform. So if we do, I believe we will survive. But the point is, it's, it, it's an irrational statement to make because our bodies keep going, our bodies may end into um, uh, um, decomposing materially on death, but actually our spirits go on. So one of the revealing things is that when any, anybody has died at his hands in ICU, when he's resuscitated them, sometimes they've gone for a long time and they are dead. When they come back, they always say, why did you bring me back? Wow. I, was in, I was in bliss. Why did you bring me back? I was in bliss. And they all say the same thing, which of course we see revealed in Eben's book, De, um, Proof of Heaven, that where, as soon as we die, we literally move into this space where immediately we are surrounded by the angelic host that we were just evoking who are there holding us and welcoming us into this extraordinary unconditional love. So yeah, that's what I feel about, of course we're going to survive. It's funny, I have to share this story with you and with everybody, it's, it just reminded me of it. And again, it provokes such a, um, such feelings of love. And it's when my father was passing away, a few days before he passed away, I was holding his hand and I was guided just to deep breathe with him and he was going between consciousness. And as I closed my eyes and I was in meditation with him, I saw myself as a little boy and he was holding my hand and we were going through the proverbial tunnel. Wow. Like, it's like, where are you taking me? And there was a light coming and we got to this point in the light and I can see these shadow figures. I'm getting the chills as I'm telling you all this. Mm -hmm. um, and I can sense my, my grandmother, my mother's mother there, who's a guardian for me. I feel her all the time. I felt my godfather there, who's a very um, pivotal masculine in my life uh, as a mentor, as someone that um, I really looked up to. I saw his brothers there. I saw other angelics in the background. And I looked up at my father. And it's like, why did we stop here? He goes, you can't go any further with me. Because if you go any further, you will cross with me. It's not your time. And I looked up at him again. Well, why'd you bring me here? I was like, well, I wanted to show them what I had done right in my life, what I'm most proud of in my life. And I just wanted to show them to you. And it was just such a feeling of connection and forgiveness and purpose of what we had done together as souls and this kinship as spirits coming here but that that shamanic journey that he took me on really took me to the essence of how we serve each other how that love can be seen in different ways that may 
seem hurtful or cause our hearts to shut down or, or become shielded. That is the essence of the protection that we've been taught to live in and, and rightfully so in so many different ways. But there's something deeper that's more at the core of the truth that's at that essence of love that nothing can put a veil over it and extinguish its light. It was such a beautiful experience. And you talking about those experiences with going to the other side, that's just evoked that in me. And I was, I had the extreme, I, I, the miracle of being able to go on that journey with my dad and getting to witness seeing that, but also still experience the love in, um, in 3D form. Um, and that's what we're being led into through this survival and really thriving into the new realm. And I, and I truly think that we're at a point as a collective that we can all not just glimpse that light that my father so beautifully sh showed me in that journey, but we get to actually carry it as a way of being. And that's exciting. I do, I, I'm very moved by this story um, mm -hmm. because I didn't have that level of relationship with my own father, which was a karmic privilege in many ways. But you know, the, the richness of the scenarios, so to speak, that you've just taken us through and how when he turned to you and said, I wanted to show, show what goodness I have created. And he's talking about you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The love, the love. Because I never experienced that from my father, you see, when he was alive. Mm. Uh, and, I, I, and he died 45 years ago, so he died a long time ago. And he died a young man who was immensely successful materially in society, but actually was fed by huge neuroses. And he realized that my sentience, because I was completely non-academic, couldn't read, couldn't, you know, couldn't do math, um, until quite late in, you know, in my teens, I couldn't read. Um, so I didn't fit into the materia, but he knew that every time he looked at me that I saw him. Mm -hmm. And I challenged his energy in a completely passive, completely feminine, completely childlike, pure, innocent way. And so when he eventually passed, very suddenly through a huge coronary, um, my first response was, oh, thank heavens for that. He was so boring. That was my response. Wow. <laughs> In completely organically. And then it took 20 years, 20 years revving forward, 20 years, when I was going through a huge crisis, a long dark night of the soul. And so what I do apropos moving into the notion of thrive, what I do when I'm in crisis is I really go to my practice. I mean, I, I have a daily practice. I'm through COVID, I've been meditating three times, sometimes four times a day. And that's passive and active meditation. But I go straight into my process. So there I was one morning chanting sacred prayers to um, one of the extraordinary influences in my life whom I met about 50 years ago. No, actually it was just after dad died. So it was about 40 odd, 40 years ago. Um, and that was Zai Baba. And so I was chanting to Zai Baba and instantaneous, complete spontaneous interaction. A, a column opened above my head and there was my father and there was my mother, my mother who died 40 years ago as well. And he was saying to me, my son, my son, I am so proud of you. And of course I burst into floods of tears because there was the healing. So it's an interesting instrument in terms of the way that we're learning our spirit technology because all that we're exchanging as I reflect is to do with the fact that we believe in transcendence. We believe that there is something remarkable about us, which is no space, no time, no weight. It is the non-material side of us, which is our spirit. So of course we're going to survive <laughs> because that is eternal and continue go continuously going on. But the thrive principle is to do with the fact that within transcendentalism, that we know that if we actually bring ourselves into the honesty of the stillness of the moment, we really detach your stillness and observe. So we're completely aware of the mindfulness of just being present in that moment. That automatically we feel ourselves in connection with an energy 
that is endless thrive, that is endless abundance. Mm. And then, of course, our job as humans, it feels, is to download what that energy is all about. And we certainly can't do it if we're, um, if we're depressed, if we're, you know, if we're deep, deep, depressed, if we're angry, if we're disconnected, if we're disassociated, if we're disenfranchised, and therefore we just simply feel deeply, deeply anxious. All of those, of course, all of those states, I mention not through any criticism or, or judgment, but they are of a very low vibration. And whenever we go there in the reality of what it is to be human, I feel we're being given an opportunity, crisis equals opportunity, to transform into the higher vibrational force of, wait a minute, this is just so delightful. This is joyous, this is loving, this is expansive. This is compassion, number one. This is pure empathy. And as a result of that, we automatically transcend. And then whatever our predicament is, it can be really severe with the end of a relationship, whether this is a divorce or death, whatever, it's, it's a dying. Or it's to do with the fact that oh, I've lost my way. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. What am I supposed to be doing? You know, the number one question that most people ask you and ask me, what's my purpose? Mm. Oh, that's simple. <laughs> people always rail. Whatever I say, I say, that's simple. We're here to optimize our creativity full of love and joy. How are you doing? And they say, oh, how do I do that? And that's where the crux is, isn't it? But if we, you know, wherever we go with the development of what those, the, that technology is, if we can just see that the universe is a personal love letter written to us by God, personal love letter. So all we have to do is address it and then there it is. Oh my God, I love that. Can I give everybody an exercise to do at home real quick? Yeah. You speak of the love letter and then I, and then I want to talk about my experience of this, of this thing called death. Um, because I want you to elaborate on it because oh, I love it when you speak this way. Um, you just evoke so many different things. So a love letter, y'all. Um, so we're speaking this love letter from God. I want you to, and I'm going to give you the end result of it because I have to for today's sake. No, I'm going to give you one part of it during each webinar, even better. So you, so show up for each one and you'll get each phase. So one homework assignment that I'm going to leave you with, and I share this in my private groups and living in extraordinary or private clients. And it's such, it's such a heart opening experience and you will not be the same after you go through this full um, exercise. Um, but between now and the time we meet next Monday, and I hope you join us next Monday or at least watch the replay, write a love letter to your beloved, whether you have one in your life right now, but the S like this person that you are just, completely in devotion to, in love with. And don't make it about what they do for you, really write about them, your love for them, express it in a way that's an outpouring of your generosity and your acknowledgements of what's being gifted to you. Um, write that, and then next week I'll give you the second part of it. Don't- oh, Cliffhanger. Or it's cliffhanger. Oh, this is, and it's a three-step process, so it's perfect. I love that this is coming out. <laughs> but now you're writing it that's like to evoke that love and the the energy of creation the torque energy that that creates by even beginning to emanate that from such a pure gifting space whenever we do that we're gifting to others truly um, and to be received that way is a gift to us so you're giving yourself both in this very personal and authentic and deep letter so it's do that and I'll reveal the second part of it. Dying, Stuart. I'm finding that the hardest, that one, I'm not the hardest, that one of the deep rooted challenges for me right now is that aspects are of me. Hmm. I am being asked to allow certain parts of me to die and to be resurrected. And there's an anger and a fear that I don't want to die. I don't want to let go of the old. And there's also an anger and the fear of, I don't know how to let go. I don't know how to allow this to come up with me, to set myself free in a new way. So it's both happening for me simultaneously. And there's a part of me that knows there's an aspect of my conscious that's the word that's going to be a natural organic progression. I don't have to force it all at the same time. But these first two that I mentioned, the anger of it, the not wanting to die, 
and the not knowing how to do it um, are provoking different emotional responses of how I interact with my own psyche on a daily basis. They're creating, you know, periods where I'm lethargic, other periods where I get excited about something, but I can't completely create it. Periods where I'm scared to move forward and create something new because I know part of me is dying off and I can't create it in the same way that I used to. So it finds that I'm spinning, if you will, in some kind of void um, while all this metamorphosis seems to be taking place. <clears throat> so response? Please, yes. Um, <laughs> we see death as physical. I believe it's actually spiritual. Mm. So, you know, you, you've been with death. I've been with death a lot. Um, because it's just something that I, you know, went through a rite of passage 40 years ago where I, I nursed my mother, who he, she and I had this immense, intense soul connection. And I nursed her while she died of cancer. So I took her all the way through the morphine processes. And, you know, I was her, I was her nurse, essentially. And then she passed. And, and it was such a blessed relief when she passed, because what goes with the disease of cancer is futility until we see it from a transcendent perspective, because it's cells eating cells. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. How futile can that be? Because the whole of my energy is creatively combustible rather than leading towards destruction. I'm not interested in destruction. I never have been. When my brother broke his toys as a child, I was always, why are you doing that? Because it, but for me, they were always highly creative vessels. So maybe it's a question of looking into what well, the reason why there are those issues there around the dying parts is to do with the fact that somehow they're caught in time. And they're caught in time because there is still something to burrow into. There is still something to, it's quite an aggressive word, but to interrogate about what is it that I'm letting go and why am I letting it go? Because there's, there's, other, there's some sort of jewel there hidden in the dust that needs to come forth. So that's my first response. The second response is, well, in order to achieve the death, maybe you don't need to do it. Maybe you need to just ask spirit guardians to help you. Beautiful, beautiful. And I share this because I, I can imagine a, some of y'all, if not all of y'all are going through a version of this experience. Because again, I think a lot of emotions are coming up. I don't think I know, I see it in social media, I see it in the news, I see the different responses of where others are going through their unique individual experience. And I have to say here now for the platform that every one of those experiences is true and right. That we're not, it's judgment creates separation and to think that one is over the other, we are not aware of somebody else's experience unless we are living in their skin. So understand that there's grace that is facilitating their emotions as grace is facilitating yours as well. Now, what we do with that and how we bring compassion in as the great transmuter of these energies to bring forward the light is our part of the journey. So any of y'all who are, again, if you're experiencing loneliness, anger, apathy, fear, um, around all of these different issues that this, um, pandemic is creating for all of us whether they're financial relational health issues spiritual transcendental issues it's all coming up um in a way that again Stuart, you and i talked about that even the temples the great temples of the gods need to be swept out from time to time and we're in a great sweeping right now yeah yes this is a this is a we're responding to cosmic cycles it's not just that COVID has been created in a laboratory, and now it's reaching through this ravaging pandemic. It's, it's actually to do with the fact that we're living a cosmic cycle where, again, a civilization that really has been lived for two and a half thousand years is dying. Patriarchalism is dying. So the question is, we know it doesn't want to die. We know it's very angry and fearful about its potential collapse. And some of the social phenomenon that we can, you know, intuit or see through 
mass media and communi communications each day leads us to an understanding of what that is all about. Um, it's, you know, so we're talking about so many wonderful subtleties and of course, spiritual technology is not, is not ipso facto, is it? It's actually nuancial. It's all about the experience of what it is to be alive. But if we, as you were just saying, and if we align ourselves with the purest energy that we have, it is love and the extrapolations thereof of compassion, kindness, empathy. But we also know that being thus, if someone is in, a, is in an altered position of that, it's not a question of the fact that we're judging it. We're just simply saying, what is accurate? What is accurate energy as a potential witness of the rare humanness that we're living on this extraordinary planet, knowing that we're spiritual beings having a human journey, there is accurate and inaccurate or appropriate and inappropriate. So for example, you know, apropos that wonderful quest that you gave us about writing a love letter to our beloved, uh, I'm meeting at the moment a lot of conspiracy theorists, uh, as I'm sure you are. And I'm meeting them either literally because a number are coming to me um, for, for readings or for counsel and um, or I'm you know meeting them online because I'm fascinated by what's the conversation that's going on at the moment um, and generally that's part of my sort of daily my daily preparation before I go into switching off and going into a very personal meditation and it seems to me that this is a commentary on the waves of energy that are part of this cosmic cycle of death and rebirth death and resurrection um, and it seems that the waves, may, maybe you have more of an identification with other waves, but the wave initially was terrible fear, mm. to a point the fact that we were terrorized by that fear. And then time passed, and people were th thinking, oh, actually, this isn't too bad, because literally, I'm no longer running around like a headless chicken. And actually, I feel really relaxed, because I'm eating well, I'm drinking well, if I can get to the, you know, to the supermarket, and the, the shelves are not empty. Well, I'm very fortunate, I guess. I go to a supermarket where the shelves are even more full now than they were before this <laughs> pandemic. It's hysterical. And what I notice also is all the shop workers are so much more friendly than they were the pandemic and so I'm making sure that I, I make hay while the sun shines you know I'm really loving them up <laughs> spending a lot of time in deep conversation however so the fear came which was a terror now that's being intellectualized and the intellectualization is moving into conspiracy theory so one of the things that I'm saying to conspiracy theories can you just theorists rather can you cease that just for a day and spend a whole day doing 12 compassionate acts. And one of them is that I want you to write love letters to a friend. And I want you to write at least 25 love letters. Dear friend, do you realize how much you are loved? Do you realize how much you are supported? Even if these days are dark, you will, all conditions are temporary, you will move into the light etc, 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 etc. Love a friend. Put it in an envelope, write on it to a friend, and stick it under a windscreen washer, or wiper rather, of a car, at, you know, in a car park at the supermarket, while you're waiting at your two meter distance, or whatever it is. <laughs> or leave it on a park bench, or leave it, you know, if you're traveling by public transport, this city this morning awoke, London City, awoke to thousands and thousands of people, arising out of lockdown and traveling on public transport, leave it on the public. Can you imagine if you receive one of those letters, the joy that it's going to bring? So it's going to be a quelling of the torment of trying to make sense intellectually of the rife emotionality that's taking place. It's merely spiritually bypassing. Now there's another wave coming because as we know, all, all, things, all things that are crucial work in threes. So there's another wave coming. And who knows, by the time we move into next Monday's co uh, conversation, which is what is spirit calling from me right now, maybe that wave will be announced. And maybe it will be to do with the fact that we're being repressed or some of us are compromising because we're believing in the governing systems. And maybe something will happen in the governing system. Because there is an overarching presence here. You know, it's rather like when Martin Luther King said, the moral arm of the universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. 
So we'll see that those people who have perpetrated falsehood or gross inequity or treachery or unkindness to others, they will, we will see them being called out. So maybe it's something to do with, with, with that, because we know that actually we're moving gradually towards the end of this interplanetary interval that really brought so much of the negativity of COVID, meaning that this unique astrological conjunction between Saturn, the karmic reaper, Jupiter, the planet of expansion, king god, and Mars, war, this conjunction came about, and it hasn't been there for 750 years. The last time it happened, there was a bubonic plague of the Black Death. And those planets, I, I understand from my astrologer friends, are actually at the edge of the solar system. So the very fact that we're receiving these gamma rays from the galactic heart, going back to that wonderful visualization that we did at the beginning to allow the love light circuitry to pour through, that they're also affected in this way. But what they do is create this opportunity for the shadow aspect of I believe the dark feminine, the destructive side of the feminine, I believe that that is what COVID is. I had an opportunity of meeting COVID. It wasn't inside my body, it was on the outside of my body when I came back from Egypt. The, the angels that I worked with, I was moving in and out of trance and, and praying to them and saying, please, can you take this from me? Because I feel that I've I've had enough fever, <laughs> so burn this off. I'm ready now <laughs> to meet resurrection. And, the, and Metatron said to me, would you like to meet the virus? Now, <laughs> I must admit that I said, Ooh, um, only if you guys are in front of me, I want you, Michael and Aradziel right here, because I know if they're there, then I'm fearless and I'm invincible. But I really, I was feeling physically enfeebled, you know, with a high temperature and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and this thing came in. And I saw, and it was horrific. There was terror in the room, you know? I could feel this. And, um, and subsequently, of course, I've met it again in a watered down version when I'm working in ICU, because I go in once a week um, with two doctors into different hospitals. And so I've met it. I've been helping people die and helping people stay alive and so forth and so forth. And um, it was horrific. But I, when I said to him, why are you here? and it said, I'm here to wage war on humanity. I gathered every single ounce of bravery and said, is that necessary? And it said, I will leave as quickly as I came. Now oh, the, yes. logic, you can, yeah? Oh, yeah. the logical significance is that on May the 29th, this conjunction ceases. So it's interesting. And then obviously, if we're still in, se in semi-lockdown through June, which for we spirit teachers is just ideal because we, we're meeting so many amazing people online and hopefully we're getting as many hugs as we can from whether it's a celestial hug or an etheric hug, <laughs> we're getting them or, you know, and from whomever, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm solitary, I don't have a partner, but, you know, I have friends, good friends that we're walking together through London parks and at a two meter distance and having very intimate conversations that I feel, I feel their love hugging me, that maybe we can move through this third wave and meet that time of practical recovery where we're we're getting back to work and there is no new normalcy we're just establishing a new neo paradigm which means that we each have space but we don't feel separate well that's beautiful sir because that's really creating a space in how to live like with this integrity we're not pushing or pulling with one another trying to get something energetically emotionally um from a way of scarcity so where we're really interacting it's like you're holding your space and your integrity and i'm not pulling from you trying to get something from you and i'm holding my space where i'm not pushing or holding something back in the fence and really when we can meet each other with that integrity the creativity that expands because the shields of the fence fall away and we are in our exalted empowerment that it's not about warring or competition. It's about 
the force field that that creates and the pillar of light that amplifies potentiality. And then we get to choose where to step in from there. It's powerful. And so even the distancing and meeting in the middle in that hug, yeah. it speaks yeah. beautifully yeah. to what we are calibrating towards our, our typical way of being into seeing that eminence and that um, reverence for that divine light that sparks from everybody. And you know, it was always a social custom 400 years ago in medieval, post-medieval Europe, that whenever you met somebody, you, you always conducted a two meter distance mm. so that you could engage in a reverence. Mm. Wow. Which was that the men bowed and the women curtsied, but it was nothing was said until that was done. And then you would look into one another's eyes and then conduct whatever was necessary, whether it was actually intimate or to do with commerciality. It's extraordinary. So actually we've got a key, haven't we? As we build our keys, which is that the old paradigm was about striving. Yes. But this new paradigm is about thriving. Mm. And that we never need to go back. Yes, we need to do, be due diligent. We need to do our work. Repetition is the mother of skill. If we fail to prepare, we prepare to fail. So we need to do our work. We need to do our practice. But there's one thing in doing it through flow and ease and reverence with the mindfulness of being absolutely present. And the other is the old modus, which is that we weren't really doing it for ourselves. We were trying to honor the, the traumatic echoes of all of those people in our past who were stern care givers or takers. And if <laughs> and I'm just reflecting on my own education because I couldn't do what they wanted me to do. So I was always a constant frustration. It created, you know, for them, it created a war. Oh, so funny. You, you were frustration and I was a hope of what they couldn't achieve. And so I was looked at the other way. It's like, oh, you did this that we weren't capable of. And so a lot of pressure to be something in the hopes of fulfilling somebody else's desire to see, again, that divinity within themselves. It's like they pass it along. It's like, I'm not going to do the work. You do it for us. And how many of y'all have felt the weight or the pressure of either one of these juxtapositions that Stuart and I are talking about right now and how it's time for us to release that burden for ourselves. But in doing so, it ripples out to the previous generations as that part fulfilled, not out of expectation, but out of releasing the illusion. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Which will really help our millennials with their sense of entitlement, which is only a bewilderment about the fact that they're not receiving what they feel they need to be receiving. But because they're normally quite held in intellect, they can't feel what it is because they know actually it's just they want love. Yeah. Um, which sort of, it brings us, it feels right in a very immaculate way to one of the key principles that I know that you and I have discussed is that when we begin to experience all of these extraordinary tendencies and we choose new trajectories, we therefore can't compromise ourselves any longer. So there is dying because we have to move out of that relationship. I mean, I can remember when I, was, when I met the angels in 87, I was living in a long-term relationship, which um, was 12 years in all. Um, and it wasn't 25 years, but it was, you know, it was a, a, of a considerable amount of there was a lot of water under the bridge, we say, <laughs> that I was told that I was mad. So I realized that, ah, so we've reached a lack of vibrational match. So I need to find a way of renegotiating this. And I tried and I tried and I tried, but my partner wasn't willing to go there. So divorce was imminent. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm a Taurian, so I love and I love and I love, you know, the, the light aspect, of course, is that I'm immensely loyal. The shadow aspect is that I'm deeply stubborn. So I don't really move until I have to move. And then I move like grease lightning. So it took some time to get the thing moving. Um, and of course, there were, you know, weepings and gnashings of teeth. But then we eventually moved. So really what I'm nudging us towards is that as we, as we juggle all of this information, um, we're unplugging from the tribal warfare of you should, you ought, you must, it is your obligation and your duty, and you do this because you are my child, or you do this because you are my student, or as the king would say, you do this because you are my subject. We unplug from all of that, 
and we move into an experience of our own sovereignty. The only way to get there is through the heroine or the hero's journey, and that requires a leap of faith, and then we have to go into the shadow, the long dark night of the soul, and fight back the demons and you know, climb the mountains and wade through the swamps of our own creation. And then suddenly, we get to the end. I must, uh, this story comes to my mind. How are we doing? Can we, can I, can I quickly tell a story? Got plenty of time, absolutely. Because I love this story and I love telling it, but I also feel that it's so cool because it really examines one of the core elements of what we're talking about. There is this noble samurai who is revered by all of his brothers. He is a high ranking samurai. samurai and is awarded, you know, he's decorated with victories because of the way that he's led fearless men or fearful men, he has not been fearless into battle and they have succeeded. I mean, this is many, many, many hundreds of years ago. But he is immensely depressed, lost his way completely. So there are all the material trophies, but inside his immaterial self is literally in blitz. So he approaches his commanding officer and says, um, I need help, I need help. And the commanding officer says, well, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're extraordinary. What do you need help about? And he said, I, I do no, no longer know the definition of heaven and hell. He'd seen so much horror in warship. He had weighed, weighed, laid waste large battalions of men, slaughtering, slaughtering that he was in this frenzy. And so the commanding officer said, ah, there is a wise man that you need to go to. It's a long journey, but if you go and, and gave him basic directions. And so deep within the conviction of his heart, he knew in that moment, as well as admiring his commanding officer, that what he was saying was absolutely true. So he went on the journey. He had to climb mountains, wade through swamps, cross rivers, fight back thickets, and eventually he arrived at his destination. And what he found was the most extraordinary garden. So he wandered through this garden and after the wastelands that he'd been through, this garden was, as we all know, it was just so refreshing. It's like when you drive for hours through the desert, you can't wait for your eyes to meet oasis. And then suddenly there is green and one feels nourished. So he walks through the garden looking for the wise man and can't find the wise man anywhere, but notices that there's an extraordinary energy in this garden. And as he wanders through, feeling this energy, he notice, notices a shining dome-like architectural thing in the distance, walks towards it, and it's a temple. So he's sitting in the temple waiting for this wise man. And suddenly, he hears a humming in the distance and thinks, oh, this must be the wise man. So he walks towards the humming and there is this little man on his hands, on, on his knees rather, with his hands in the earth. His hands are filthy and he's the gardener. So of course the samurai summons all of his might and says, you tell me, where is the wise man of this garden? And the, gar the gardener looked up at him and said, who's asking? How dare you ask me? Except he didn't smile. <laughs> and the samurai said, how dare you speak to me in this way? Tell me where it is. And automatically the gardener retorted, how dare you speak to me in this way? Look at you, you're filthy. How dare you come into this garden? And the samurai lifted his sword and the little man said, that is hell. And he dropped his sword aghast. And the little man said, and that is heaven, my son. Oh, wow. And in that moment, of course, all of his cells were blown up, the samurai cells were blown apart so that he was actually able to move into the remorse that he needed to feel, which he hadn't been able to feel in killing all of those people, and thence move into experiencing grace moving through him so that God was merciful with him. And of course, immediately he left the samurai, uh, the samurai brigades. So I feel that this, you know, that this is this time, do you see, that the, 
the hell that we're experiencing is the horror of COVID and the terrible stories that we're hearing about the fact that the, the, the disease, the virus is affecting the very pneuma of our beings. It's affecting our lungs and it grips hold of the alveoli in our lungs to such an extent that literally it starves us, starves us of oxygen. So it literally is suffocating us. And I've met this with the dear ones that I've served in ICU. They're normally not in their bodies, they're out of their bodies because they're in such duress, but they are being fed retroviral drugs and adrenaline to keep them alive, you know, because their vital signs are beginning to go. And helping doctors find, intuitively find a way of going into major veins because it's either an arm or a groin or the jugular. And the easiest thing to pump into the heart is to get closest to it through the jugular. But if somebody's in that level of arrest, it's very difficult to find the vein. So I actually intuitively have been asking, helping the doctors as I lean over their shoulder, go a little bit to the left, go a little bit to the right. And they say, how did you do that? And suddenly the catheter goes in. So the dear one is, is able to, um, to breathe once again. But isn't it interesting that it's affecting our lungs and not our bowels, the very spirit of life. Just as, what is it now, 25 years ago, just as it affected the AIDS patients, right? the lungs. So isn't it interesting? It's to do with our thymus gland. It's to do with the heart. We know that the weakest area of our body is actually our solar plexus because it's the darkest area of our body where we hold so much shadow. But actually what this is all about is giving us an opportunity of dying to the unlove and opening of resurrecting to the new love so that the pneuma becomes fleshed out with oxygen and our hearts open into what we're seeing is the golden ray of the new kingdom. Mm-hmm. So I love how you're synthesizing all this together and it's evoking so many different things in me. Y'all, we will take questions. So if y'all are typing in questions, April's going to post them for me here in the chat so we can get to some of those as well. But it, God, this is so aligned with so many of the things that I feel are coming up also and that my guides are also sharing with me. My intuition is leading me forward to. So all of y'all on the call, a little bit further down on the Beyond Tribe page, which you join to, so you can access this video. It's a wind hop breathing technique video that I put up there and it guided. And it's, I really was looking for something to open up my solar plexus as well. I found that I was breathing just up to my diaphragm and stopping there. And I wasn't taking full breaths. There was something like, there wasn't a movement that was happening. And so these breathing exercises um, are powerful and to intentionally go into the physicality of assisting our lungs, of assisting the energy to move through in a more facilitated way is, will be hugely beneficial. So if you speak of that, that's wonderful, Stuart. So y'all can scroll down there later. The video's posted, it's super easy to find. But for me, this also speaks of what I've been feeling over the last two to three months is this energy that's been running in my solar plexus and it's uncomfortable. It's been taking me out, if you will. It's, I feel my body a little more tired than usual. I feel that I, when I try to exercise in certain ways that I can't, there's this energy running in my solar plexus and it could be partial adrenal fatigue, but there's also something that's being birthed that is spinning in the energies as we go through these waves, Stuart. And it's asking me to be present with it. It's asking for awareness. It's asking me to listen to the subtle cues of how I interact in my day, where I put my energy, who I interact with. Do I associate with these other things that are being shared in different media posts and how it lands for me personally, instead of me trying to reach for that sword and fight somebody else's fight, because that's not where we are right now. We're in a place of looking and feeling. Again, looking and feeling. So we're integrating our intellectual capacity. We're bringing in this cosmic awareness that many of y'all in this community are so beautifully adept to, and it feels so wonderful to be in that energy as we connect to our guides, to the angelics, to that divine source and bring it in. 
And we're also asked to bring in the embodiment of our daily actions and how we resonate with that and express it onto the world. So in essence, what we're doing is we're bridging this capacity for heaven and earth to anchor in. But not only that, it's also going vertical now. And so we've been working on doing this for a long time. And I really believe that we've reached the, we've come to the apex of it and it's creating this explosion, this wave, this ripple of how in that integrity, as we align those things and they emerge, they form that magnetism, there's a spark. And just this, there's like universes being born galaxies that reach out from your intentionality out of that integrity. And that is where our creativity or creative spark and how we will start seeing the intentions of our creation taken form in the manifestation in this 3D reality that we get to hold through these different um, sensational mechanisms that allow us to interact with one another here. So this closeness, this intimacy, will feel not only the physical intimacy, but that intimacy that you and I create together, sir, when we know that alignment takes place and we have a conversation, it just combusts and it'll keep combusting and just, that is truly what I feel that is becoming available to all of us, but we're learning really how to become beautiful creators yeah. of it as we have these individuated experiences. I love it. The, ge the geometry is just so obvious to see, isn't it? The, the vertical and the horizontal, which mm -hmm. in, in, in the hermetic principles is the heros gamos. It's the exactly. sacred marriage. Um, and it's the cross, isn't it? And yes. so whereas we, we've been led over the last 450 years to center everything here, um, now what we're realizing is that it's actually in the, in the uh, vortices that's created by the meeting of the horizontal and vertical of the, what's known as the axis mundi and the anima mundi, that this is male and this is feminine. And the anima mundi is the animating principle of the universe, you know, that everybody believed in, which is God's breath, because the whole of nature is alive with it, until Isaac Newton said, that's not true, it doesn't exist. The, the, the earth is merely a lump of matter hurtling through space. And so literally, there was a revolution in medieval universities, that that we believed in for a thousand years, that men, mostly in university, meditated on mm. through their alchemy and through their hermetic principles and whatever their belief systems were. The ladies did it because the ladies guided us whenever we felt weak, we go straight into nature. We go into a receive from Mother Earth and we would participate, petition and, and praise together and we'd feel emboldened, then we'd come back. So you see, what's so beautiful about this, John, is that which is one of the reasons why I want to celebrate again the conviction of my relationship with you, is that I can do this with you because you sit in your heart. This is an experiential that you, you've acquired over the years. You're, you're no longer living, if you ever were, you're no longer living up here. You know what I mean? In that real cerebralization of what that is all about. That's, that's to do with, inter I mean, I, I, I don't wish to use that parody as a, a criticism or as a, um, anything that's within my spleen. It's just an illustration. I'm not projecting into it. But when we come, when we really come into here where you sit, where I would like to think I sit as well, then this is the meeting point. This is the meeting point. And what we've been talking about in terms of in true integrity, which really means integration, doesn't it? You Thank know, you. When, when we get the parts of our beings, I think that's what we're addressing, the different parts of our beings. And when we bring them together into integration, the radiation of integrity is so purposeful, but we don't have to work it. We just are it. It's like learning a skill, whether it's surfing, making babies, or playing tennis, climbing a mountain. It's where is the middle point? Where is the zone? Where is the still point out of which all energies then are generated and meet flux? Where is that? We've lost that center and now here we are returning to it. And who would know that it's actually the hidden cache of all of our love and all of our grace and all of our compassion. It reminds me of that wonderful story about, you know, when, when God says, I have something really special for the human being, but I don't know where to put it. 
and all the animals give different interpretations. And then I think it's, is it an ant who says, I know what, put it inside them, they'll never find it. <laughs> Here we are beginning to, you know, we're getting wise finally <laughs> after, ha, 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 what is it? Um, well, I suppose if we go back into ancient civilization with Atlantis and Numeria, we're talking about the last 450,000 years. Um, that gradually we're getting wise and, and therefore possibly remembering what the Atlanteans and Numerians, if they were the civilizations that came before Greece and Rome, which I believe they were, um, that we're we re remembering. And as a result of that, right now as we speak, as we embody the furnace of our own individual heart connecting with the um, the collective heart, the universal heart, into the, ca the, gal the galactic heart that this is coming through. And if I may say that, you know, as we speak, this is really at the core of what Diana wanted us to have. It's just that her vessel was only just beginning to mature, and then she was taken from us. It's such an irony. So that she could actually be more useful on the other side than here. <laughs> and now we're ready to receive the immense pulsation of what her love was all about. So, you know, if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, please tune into my recent book, Diana, The Voice of Change, which is in audio and selling like hotcakes, and that's wonderful. Um, to spread the word, yeah. Amazing. I want, to about, I want to talk more about your book afterwards. Maybe in the last, we really want to highlight it a lot also because it's, it's... We need to go to questions, do we? We need to go to questions, but we're not having any questions being typed in from April right now. So I, I think we're great there. But one thing I wanted to point out for everybody on the call, again, it's, again, through my experiences and there's a calibration taking place. So there's not this all or nothing type of process that's happening. It's as we get into that cross point, again, the, the Axis Monday meeting the, what's the other Monday? Uh, the Anima. The Anima, thank you. Yeah. So the, the Axis is male and the Anima is feminine. The Anima. As we get into that, it gives us this, this flow of our, of our whole being, that aspects of our being, to be aware, to feel, and to sense, and to and to intuit through our innate, um, oh, it's not intuition, whatever. it's um, when we just carry it within us, it's instinctual. It becomes instinctual when something becomes a little bit off. So for example, I woke up this morning and for some reason there was like a, a wave of heaviness and I felt like, I, like a grumpiness that was coming over me like and anxiousness and anger a little bit. And I didn't know where it was coming from because everything seems pretty good. Maybe my car's acting up a little bit. Maybe that was part of it. But there was something that was kind of leading me astray from my center. And I could have had that lead all day and just kind of gone about and gone into the different things that I was preparing for, including this call. But I was really called into a practice to, to take time to be intimate with what was coming up without having to define it, but to notice it and to go through the alchemy of what was coming up through me. And first of all, it's like, what is this? Who is this and why am I feeling this way? So it was identifying it. Wait, I have anger, I have frustration. I have something that's making me uncomfortable in my body. It's like, hmm, okay. And what's it taking away from me right now? What well, makes me angry that's taken away my center? It makes me angry to take away my focus. It makes me angry that I want to be somewhere else, but it's calling me into something. I feel angry that my body's reacting in this way and I don't know what to do about it. So the chemical process of acknowledging and being with it allow it to come to the surface, which also allows our neuropathology to start creating different um, chemistry so that we can start imprinting something different. So at first acknowledging was beautiful for me. And this is a five minute process, y'all. Um, it's quick, it doesn't have to take long. And then I got to be in the sadness of it. It's like, wow, this makes me sad. If, if, if I'm this, I'm gonna be alone or I can't do what I wanna do or something's being taken away from me. So really getting into the depths and the authenticity and integrity of my sadness and being with it. 
oh, I have to earn my love to sh by showing up a certain way. I can't be accepted for who I am. It's not okay if I'm angry. It's not okay if I'm the different things and allow yourself to go through just whatever the truth is. Speak to your five-year-old. Don't cognitize it. Don't intellectualize the sadness. Allow the four-year-old to speak the sadness. And then you'll know that you've hit the essence of the truth because it doesn't try to complicate it. And then from the sadness, it's like, well, okay, now, well, now I realize that this is what I've been wanting to create and I didn't. It's like, but now I can be aware after the sadness and sitting with that in my body. Well, hold on a second. What is it in truth that I am mourning here? Again, the depth that's coming through. It's like, oh, wait, I'm trying to earn my love by being so-and-so. I'm trying to have all the answers. I'm trying to, whatever it is that you're trying to do. Uh, so one that came through for me was that I am trying to be the one that is responsible for everything that comes through that needs to be fixed. Um, and so that awareness, again, sank in the wisdom of my body, of the intellect that's coming through, but also that stream of energy from the divine. It's like, this is where you're trying to leave from. And then we replace it. It's like, well, hold on a second. It's not my job to do that. And you bring in a joy to it by realizing it. There's a celebration. It's like, wow, I can't be responsible for everything and everybody. I can't derive my happiness by having other people love me. I, like all these things and getting into how ridiculous it is that we put all these expectations within ourselves, but we don't really put them onto other people. Sometimes we do, but most of the time, any expectations that we put onto others, we are amplifying at 10, 100 times greater for ourselves. And so to get into a very grounded aspect of how we're expecting so much of ourselves and how silly it can be and how it's robbing us of being in relationship in the way that we really want is beautiful. And then what does that gift us by knowing that that's silly and by wanting to change the pattern in this process? It's typically always freedom. It's like, wow, if I let this go, I'm free. I don't have to carry that burden anymore. And mm -hmm. so we're all going through these things, whether we're picking up collective energies with a lot of y'all are so empathic that you, you can't help but to, but know that as it's running and coursing through your body, you're getting to transmute again, you're sweeping out your temple also. And in the process, sweeping out the grand temple for the collective by just pausing for five, 10 minutes and doing a simple process like this and being in relationship with that, which is coming up for us right now that's being with us right now that it doesn't have to scream at us the rest of the day or the rest of the week. If we just drop in in presence, not to change it, but to allow it its flow of the wisdom that it's wanting to give to us in the moment. And sometimes it'll transmute quickly, but by just providing the opening, it's not something that's going to linger and hold you prison in the same way. So again, this is part of the, of the cross yeah. together and expanding out and meeting and the integrity of the wisdom that it wants to share and also what's purging through us to give the space for that light that's emanating. That's really, it's, it's expanding and it's gonna burst, but that burst can be really graceful or we can experience it with a lot of different calamities in our life and, and I choose to do it with grace and wanna invite you all to do with grace as well. That's the, uh, a fascinating flow of consciousness that you've just taken us through. And as you speak it, I'm reminded of the fact that um, because of the journey towards sovereignty that we're all moving towards uh, and unplugging from systems that have been the governing systems that have always brought about a relationship for us between uh, we personally, microcosmically, and the fact that the governing system is an illustration of the macrocosm. We know now that it was not God, often, that it was based on corruption, So, which is one of the reasons why we're, we're... However, we've moved into such a separation that we believe in narcissism, and so that when we're feeling something, we get narcissistically involved in oh what is this and as you were doing no you were taking yourself into present present moment mindfulness of what is this that i'm experiencing 
And you see, for me, as you speak, because I wasn't going through the process that you were going through, I had my own process this morning, <laughs> which actually, interestingly, was very aligned as a parallel. Mm -hmm. And so as I, as I detached, felt stillness and observed it all, um, I realized that it's Mars energy because my problem was my liver. Anger. Mm, yeah. And I was bile, I was full of bile, you know. So when I woke this morning, I had a headache. And after drinking water, I needed to rush to the bathroom, you know. Um, and this thing came, the you know, stuff came out of me. And then I recovered throughout the course of the morning in the way that I normally do. So I was actually able to see that, you know, whatever was taking place yesterday, and there wasn't anything of huge upheaval, mm -hmm. but that I am a microcosmic version of the macrocosm and what's happening at the moment is that we're all in an interrelated way exploring how we can release our spleen our bile our anger because um if we don't this is very alarmist and we do hear it but we've only got possibly 15 or 20 years of living on this planet before she combusts um, because she's poisoned. The lungs of the planet are being defamed and denuded, as we know, Brazil, Brasilia and the rainforests of Brazil are being denuded. I mean, so we're not going to be having the oxygen to breathe. However, as we know, going back to um, uh, the wonderful substance of the futurist and uh, the positivism of the future, that we also know that through the last month and a half, the ozone layer is sealed for the first time in something like 80 years. And the streets of major cities are easier to walk through because they're less polluted because people haven't been driving around and burning gasoline. And I don't know if anybody else noticed, I think we talked about this, but as soon as I became aware of the uniqueness of the miracle of this time that I went into a very, very deep listening. And in the deep listening, I felt that nature was not, was impinging in a very positive way, not encroaching, but impinging, almost as though it was coming in and saying, we're here, I'm here, look. And it seemed that it was so beautiful. The skies of London were the clearest that I've ever seen. And where I live is on an arterial route for the fly paths going to London Heathrow Airport. And um, the planes were not flying over. Amazing. So all yeah. of this, you know, it's very interesting because as you were speaking, I thought, well, I wonder what the angels are saying right now. So I opened the Angels of Atlantis Oracle, just to oh, choose. And one of them is Raphael Earth Force which is all about healing. Raphael is the holy healer, of course, healing earth force. And that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? That we take full responsibility for our, the status that we have, both internally and externally, as spiritual beings having a human journey. And as soon as we do this, and we recognize that paradise can be within, that Michael comes forward with the kingdom of the enchanted. Ah, oh, beautiful. Ah. How more important that be? to me a lot these days the cosmic leader well understandably right because <laughs> where are we going where are our leaders and i know that's a subject that we're going to get to eventually in another conversation about the whole substance of um you know are, are are we really determining what our spiritual values are that are going to carry us together as a collective in a state of non-separation into our future because this is the dawning of the golden age it truly is. And again, we'll get into that in the next conversations. We have another two webinars to really go deep. I wanted to share this. And again, it's another channel guidance that I had. I was, I was actually going through a somatic session on a massage table and um, the therapist was just the space that she held was so beautiful. And she held me on my shoulder and it's, and she was just holding there, bringing awareness to whatever tightness was there. And I was eyes closed. And then all of a sudden there's this welling up and this crying and sobbing. I started sobbing on the table and it was Gaia that was coming through and she had this message and it was, it's like, yes, what you see in me is a reflection of what you're doing to yourself. Know that you can never truly kill me or extinguish me, but I love you so much that I am willing to take on and to mirror back to you the pain of suffering that you're causing within yourselves. Look to me as the destruction 
that you are causal in each other. I will survive for years beyond you, but you need to be aware of where you are shutting yourself out, where you're polluting your heart to a point where you're not allowing to love the stream in. Allow me to hold you, allow me to reflect to you that love. But as you see me deteriorating and aging, if you will, know that this is what you're doing upon yourselves. And I, as the love, as the divine mother that I am, will take on all the pains of my sons and daughters. Please pay attention and heal yourselves. Decontaminate yourselves. Release yourself of the toxicity that you're holding within. And as you heal, I will heal. And so it's, it's such a beautiful reflection of what was coming. And I was just, I was in tears, sobs, not crying on the table. It was so profound. Um, but it was such an accurate reflection of what's happening. So I really see this. And, and I think we should probably get towards wrapping up on today's call. What I am seeing this, everything that is coming up for us, this is great purging, yes. But this is also what we've been asking for, Stuart collective what we said how do we create the lives that we want how do we create this heaven on earth how is it that we create this abundance in a way that feels really good um and it's being redefined and the foundation is being shaken so that it can be rebuilt and i just this is being gifted to us in lots of different ways. and i know that they're suffering in so many different ways so again with so much reverence for each of our individual journeys and how we're having these experiences truly and with so much compassion and awareness of what i'm receiving Stuart, is that this is happening for us not to us and we're being gifted and we're so loved that that which we've been asking for that has hit this collective peak in the asking from this beautiful place of being and becoming um it's meeting us because we have requested it and we are being stewarded forward in a way that is scary and something is dying, but we're birthing something new and we're being called into a period of faith beyond any faith that we've had before because it is so new that nobody can truly tell you where it is that we're heading, but somehow we, that divinity within us knows it has an intelligence of where it is heading. Mm -hmm. Yes, because have you experienced, as we go through the stillness, although I know we're both quite busy, it's a different level of busy because we're no longer surrounded by the frantic doing of our brothers and sisters, God bless them, and society has calmed down. Um, that there's a consistency. A lot of people I know are saying to me, one day just rolls into another. <laughs> There's a consistency rather than the sharp edges that we normally feel. And it seems to me that this is an exposition into time and that we know that one of the part of our ascension, descension process, you know, the verticalization, the horizontalization, that we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper is the fact that the space-time continuum will distort. And so it seems to me that the consistency is the energy that Mother is giving to us to be able to sustain the workings out that you've just enumerated so beautifully, to sustain them. So they don't switch on and switch off. And therefore the cerebral cortex changes because of course, one of the things that's crucial is that we switch on, switch off, switch on, switch on, you know, blinking, blinking, blinking. And of course, the more we intellectualize, the more rapid eye movement takes place. And of course, all we're doing is switching on, switching on, switching on, switching on, switching on. And therefore, of course, we're suspended between the heightened features and the shadow-like features. What Blake refers to as joy and woe, you know, when he wrote, joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine, when this ye rightly know, safely through the world ye go. I feel that we're actually re-examining that equation which he gave us in the 18th century and finding that we don't need to go yo-yo joy whoa joy whoa like we did when we were babies you know to explore although it was difficult we were exploring the capacity of the way that we were the, the way that we innately feel that this is all about no we will inherit the kingdom of heaven it is here but what we need to do is just feel ourselves within peace and stillness thriving rather than striving Right. So beautiful. So beautiful. 
All right, Stuart, we're going to continue on the next call. Um, okay. Stuart, I can do it, but give everybody, if you all are, do not come to the next session, again, I highly recommend um, continuously working with Stuart again. This energy that emanates and this truth that evolves, is, it's phenomenal. So I know you're offering readings, and of course, the book is wonderful. Um, so how about we just, how about you just post it in, in the page, how to connect with you, the readings that you're offering, how to find the book, um, and, and people can just connect that way. And for anyone who's interested in working with me, I'll post the, the membership site. Y'all, most of y'all know me from beyond the ordinary show, but I'll put the, the show link on there as well for anybody who's new to my community also. And we'll just we'll keep sharing from those spaces as well. Um, so we'll have that. Any last words that you want to leave everybody with, Stuart, or it, like invoke, the, maybe we can invoke this Christ of consciousness and, and just, just put this beautiful layer of that, of that Christos on top of today's call. Yes, we, we've talked many things, haven't we? And so it's been very exercising on yes. all levels of being. But as a result, possibly people are feeling stimulated into the greater being, the greater reality. And what we need to do is to be very simple and come back to our hearts. Yes. And realize that this is where it generates from. Mm. And so maybe we, we need to just feel a moment of stillness where we feel the pranic cord, the axis mundi going through us, and this beautiful golden heart with a golden star surrounding it. And that in the silence, if we just breathe in very deeply, so as we breathe in, we receive from Divine Mother. And when we breathe out, we breathe into her space. And of course, breathe our love out into the web that John was talking about at the beginning. And each breath allows the heart the golden heart, the golden star, to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's no longer just an image in our hearts, but it actually becomes part of our etheric sheath and beyond. And then rays from the star shine out and connect with each one of us in the collective experience of this conversation and beyond into touching our brothers and sisters. Uh, my solar plexus is lit up doing that story. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautiful, huh? Yeah. Uh, Diana came in with such love. Uh, what a beautiful practice. I would suggest that all of us listening, I'm going to, maybe when we first wake up in the morning or before we go to bed at night, get back into this practice. Come back and listen to this. It'll be posted here on the Facebook page all week. So come back and listen to us and and bring in um this relationship with this divine light that you brought in story thank you so much yeah something old is being reborn so i i it, it's something that has played through me so much so when you said this to me last week about i feel that it's golden you know, i was very moved by that as you were because it was something that i was thinking and then you there you were saying it so I will I will create um, an extended meditation using it and I hopefully will record towards the end of this week because the schedule is quite tight oh beautiful all right well we'll wait to receive that story thank you so much and um next That's week great. same time Monday 12 30 p.m pacific time we'll put the time zones on there for everybody I'm horrible at time zone conversion so we'll try to delineate it so it's a, it translates a little bit easier because I have much awareness on the translation on that on my side. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got it. So it's 12.30 Pacific okay. and it's 1.30 Mountain Time, of course. E EST 3.30 in the afternoon and 8.30 in the UK, 8.30 p.m. in the UK. And what it means for y'all in Australia, I'm not quite sure, but it's pretty oh, close to my time. Yeah. That's really complex. Sorry, people. In <laughs> Why is it that I always forget about the Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> I'm joking, by the way, I don't. I don't. It's part of the 
macrocosmic experience. It's that British poshness that comes through with the Australians. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so funny. Hey, y'all, thank you so much for being on this call on the webinar with us. And there's so much that um, is coming through. Um, and I really feel that we've just mm. recreated this beautiful, energetic um, container that's an invitation of what is the invitation for what we're stepping into, what we're having compassion and forgiveness for, um, and how we get to ignite that spark from all aspects from our shadow, from our darkest shadow to our purest light for the integration, integration of it all. Um, so that level of creativity and that God within us um, can really stream forward without fear of being too much or not enough. Um, it's all being transmuted. It's all being translated and reverbalized um, for a new sound experience as we emanate our resonance out into the world. Um, so wonderful. Again, Stuart, thank you so much. Bless you, John. Bless you. Bless you. And namaste to everybody. See you Bye. next week. Bye.